Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be. Thank you for attending this Google Education on-air event, Google Earth and Education Part 2. My name is Thomas Fitra, and this is Jerome Berg. Uh, welcome. I, I'm uh, glad to be here. I'm, uh, I'm in California, and Thomas is somewhere around the other side of the globe, and um, I'm, I've done... Uh, Google Lit Trips, and, and Tom does this wonderful math project, and we both use Google Earth. We're hoping that we can have a nice conversation about uh, using Google Earth effectively in a classroom. Okay, great. And uh, as Jerome said, I am in uh, coming from Guam. Uh, before we get started, let me do some some of the preliminaries here. If you are uh, viewing this, the best way to, to view these on-air Hangouts is to actually open two browser windows there and, and here's like an example of the setup where you've got one browser window where you're watching the video and then the other the other one is where you can type comments and that way you're not going back and forth um, because comments don't refresh in the on-air hangouts automatically so if you want to see if you want to follow the comment the chat stream then um, what you do for that window is you just refresh that now and then you'll see the the questions and comments as they come in and I know Jerome and I would uh, definitely would invite you to you know add a comment right now if you could just let us know who you are or where, where you're viewing this from uh, if you've got any questions throughout the presentation you can enter that in that chat stream there and Jerome and I will keep an eye on that and try to address that but the other browser window then you, you keep that with your video view and and then don't refresh that one just keep that on and if you if for any reason anything cuts out uh, just go back and look for the hangout and join it again and, and then you should be all set okay uh, the other thing if you're following us on Twitter uh, Jerome there's a the um, Twitter address for for uh, Jerome is Google lit trips and for me it's a uh, real world math and for this event, the hashtags are eduonair and hashtag earthedu. Now, the eduonair is the Google Earth Education On Air Hangouts. And if you have not watched any of these uh, yet, there's uh, another month of these that are happening almost every day in the next, in the next week. So if you want to find more edu uh, Google Education On Air Hangouts, go to that address there I have listed, uh, sites.google.com slash site slash edu on air and you'll find all kinds of uh, interesting presentations from uh, mainly Google certified teachers. Jerome and I are both Google certified teachers. Jerome, uh, you are Apple distinguished educator as well, correct? Yes, I am. And, uh, and I'm a Google apps certified trainer. And you'll find uh, a lot of people like that uh, presenting these education on air hangouts. And then one more shout out I'd like to give to the Global Education Conference, which is starting this next week. If you didn't, if you haven't watched that before, do a search for that and find their schedule. The, the Global Education Conference is a uh, is an excellent excellent on air conference uh, with uh, high quality presenters from uh, around the world, and that's going to last this uh, next week also. Uh, and and Jerome, I, I forgot to ask you, are you presenting during that this year? Uh, not this year, I'm afraid. I have uh, brand new twin grandsons that are keeping me uh, otherwise <laughs> occupied. <laughs> okay, and nor, nor am I. I'm not. Uh, I'm not presenting this year, also. But um, yeah, who says professional development only happens during the summer, right? If there's just opportunities all the time. Okay, so Jerome, could you give us, you know, for the people that that. Um, you know, there's some people that are joining us uh, new this time. I think. Could you give us a little um, description of Google Lit Trips and and you know if you want to add more on what you do? Sure. You want to uh, you want to pop up uh, slide two just for the heck of it? <clears throat> there we go. Oh, up here it is. There you go. There you go. Uh, so uh, Google Lit Trips was uh, a project that uh, popped into my mind while I was sitting in the very first Google Certified Teacher uh, Training uh, uh, Institute or whatever when, when Google first got into this business. I happened to live a, uh, right across the San Francisco Bay from Google's main headquarters and uh, was able to get myself selected in that group. and. And uh, when I walked in the door, they asked us, uh, you know, they told us that they were going to do all kinds of nice things for us, which they have. 
and that they were going to ask us to do a couple of advocacy uh, projects um, in exchange, sort of a win-win um, situation. And uh, I was sitting there looking at Google Earth, and I thought Google Earth was made so that I could look up my address and see my house online. But while the while the Google Earth guy was uh, uh, presenting, he, I saw Google Earth, and he had a line on the on the on your surface somewhere. And I, I said, what the heck is that line? And he says, oh, that's a path. You can draw a path to this um, in Google Earth projects. And in one second, I thought, I wonder if I could pass off Plotting the Travels of Candide, a book I had taught for 30 years on Google Earth. And then maybe the kids could just travel along with Candide. And it just seemed like a kind of a cool idea. And, um, well, to tell you the truth, Google Lit Trips stands for Google Earth-based literature trips. And so I started building these things, and it caught fire. Um, and now that's what I do full time in my retirement is produce these. Now, the, the, it's pretty important to me that uh, if you weren't here last week and, it, and if you haven't heard of Google It Trips, that you know this is a sort of a retirement philanthropy for me. Google gives away the software. It works on the free version of Google Earth, and I give away all these resources. So um, I'm kind of thinking a teacher who was really inspirational to me by trying to be some sort of support for the teachers who are still inspiring students in their own classroom. So if you went to googlelittrips.com, you'd wind up at the website and um, you could search around for all of that stuff and download it and do as you please. And so that's what I'm doing. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we've got some comments already coming in, Jerome, so it looks like we're, we're broadcasting okay. Uh, let me add uh, here, th my website is uh, realworldmath.org, and I'm the creator of that. Uh, Jerome and I both have had these websites out there for like four to five years. Uh, mine is also a free resource for teachers and students to use. It's got math lessons and activities that are placed in the, in the virtual world of Google Earth. Um, so let me try to get through because uh, I, I, we've got some repeat visitors and stuff, and I don't. And I look like, well, they said this last time, but let me try to kind of cut through this in like five minutes, just kind of give a, a the briefest synopsis I can on on what happened last time. Uh, for me, um, you know, and I went back and watched it again. If you if you missed part one, it's also you can find it in listed in my posts in Google Plus, and you can also find it in. If you search for it in YouTube, you'll find a video of that discussion. But um, the thing that I that kind of jumped out at me was uh, the scale. And when you're when you're working in Google Earth, uh, obviously there's this tremendous sense of scale of where you can see the entire planet, or you can zoom down into your in, down into your neighbor's backyard. And and the same thing goes for concepts or lessons that you're you're going to do. And so when you approach something in in Google Earth. The ideas that you have can be broad, general themes, or you can focus down into, you know, more specific kind of things that you want students to work with. Is that how do you agree with that, Jerome? Yeah, I, yeah, I just love that. I'm sorry you caught me. I was I was responding oh. to one of the. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, All I right. do like the uh, I, I do like the fact that it's it's a different paradigm for mapping entirely, which I think is at the heart of what both you and I do. It's it's not just geolocating. It's it's using that ability to zoom in and zoom out to get large scale context geo context right down to a, a very tight geo context and um, tilting and, and orienting the views differently just makes it a three dimensional world that we can put kids in. Right, and and just uh, and and as far as like the activities that you have, it's not it doesn't have to be just like a viewing, a static kind of view, but you can get into high, really higher level, higher level activities. And so the you know the second thing I have here is the uh, the context, and the things that we do, like my website I mentioned was you know kind of cliche, right, real world math, but literally you provide that context of things happening in the world that students can relate to it or. You know, for you, for for your um, for your books and stuff, you show them like you know actually the scene and the the uh, panorama that uh, the characters are facing in the different books, and so uh, being able to provide that real world 
context, uh, real world ideas at any any level, I, I think really adds is is a good feature of, of Google Earth. It's really uh, what makes it what it is. The yeah, I like to tell people. Oh, I'm sorry. Ahead. No, go <laughs> I ahead. I like to tell people that um, I, I, I want to put people in the back seat of that car with the Jode family and Grapes of Wrath looking west and looking right through the same windshield. I, I like to put them right there with with uh, the duckling family and make way for ducklings. Now, I realize not everybody out there is uh, literature teachers, of course, but we're talking about the paradigm shift that Google Earth can bring to to um, all of our uh, implementations. And, and so it's what we English teachers like to call a suspension of disbelief. You can actually put them right in the middle of the world, and then you put a math problem around them. You put a cultural awareness around them. You put historical events all around them because they're there. Right, and then and that kind of leads into the, the next one I have is uh, that it's dynamic. And so uh, I don't I won't say I won't get into like books being a static kind of thing, but the, dy the dy dynamic interface with Google Earth that you can you can move it. They can change their view. They can zoom in and out. You can uh, direct them to other other activities. They can draw on the Earth's surface. They can add content. It's editable. You can you can edit the Earth. Uh, this makes for a, a more dynamic, uh, active learning, active learning experience. And and then. We'll try to move to the next one. Here we go. Um, and then uh, you, we spoke uh, quite a bit about, you know, how the world is not, the world is not divided up into an English classroom, a math classroom, a science classroom. In the real world, everything's overlapping. Every, when you go into any kind of area, you can you can go into math or the arts or history or science. That uh, the things that that we put into Google Earth are just seem to be more dynamic just because that's the setting, the Earth. And it's also the setting in the real world. In the 21st century, which is 12% uh, over already, but uh, it's about global relationships, global bu business, working globally with different cultures uh, on the same tasks, on the same hobbies, and the same, uh, just the way we engage with the world. It's a neighborhood now at the global level. And we and we share that's the same uh, kind of a pedagogical approach to Google Earth, that the the globalized the globalized view, and and also uh, addressing how people learn, and addressing different learning styles, uh, visual learners, tactile learners, um, making it more of an active experience rather than the, the student being um, um, just a, a viewer of the of the content. And then you know what I think we I'd like to get into some more is the kind of the technology side of it, not so much the nuts and bolts, but uh, you know for most things for 21st century learning, let, let's put it that way. That you have that in the, in the middle. When you have technology, it automatically lends more things to the lessons where you can collaborate on things, you can edit the content, you can uh, connect and share with other people the ideas, and so when you when you start working in Google Earth, then you have that whole other realm of things that open up for for you to um, to share with others. Um, let me just remind people that if you are typing comments in a separate window, which is the best way to do it, make sure you refresh every once in a while because you won't see anything that follows you unless you ref refresh your screen. Right. So, so uh, refresh the video screen. <laughs> You know, uh, Jerome, I picked out one of my lessons that I think kind of um, summarizes all you know all these things too. I think it's a good example. So let me let me share this one with you. It's called a uh, whale watch, and uh, and 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 this was from uh, you know a summer in Boston. I went on one of the whale watching tours, and 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 this is like how I get ideas for the things that I do. So I'm on the whale watching tour, and we're going out. We're trying to find the whales, and then. And, you know, I started thinking, like, well, how do they know where these whales are? Part of it is communication with other boats or, you know, some of it is, like, where the whales hang out, I guess. But, you know, really, it's a pretty big ocean when you go out there. So it's kind of amazing when they when they come across. They guarantee you a whale, you know, on your, you know, that you're going to see a whale on your trip. So, you know, afterwards, I started thinking of an activity for this. And so I did this whale watch one for Google Earth. And 
this is a, a for my for my website, which is for math. It's a, really about data analysis. And what I found online was the data for right whales, which are endangered. They're endangered because they're slow-moving whale that that they uh, they tend to linger around the surface uh, more maybe than other whales and stuff. And so in this busy ship traffic area, the whales are struck by boats. They get tangled into the um, lobster trap, fishing gear kind of things. And so the right whale is a, an endangered whale. So I found all this data and I put it into Google Earth. And so there's like hundreds of place marks that, that show the, the, the whale data. Now, so, so what's happening there? I'm not just, I'm using Google Earth to present it, but I also incorporate the use of other technology like spreadsheets. So they get to see the data on a spreadsheet, which normally isn't that exciting in itself. But when you put the data into Google Earth, it makes it a lot more attractive. And just like in the spreadsheet where you can sort and kind of filter the data and examine it in different aspects, like when were the whales seen, What's, uh, what size was the group, then that, that adds a, another aspect to, to the lesson uh, You know, for this one. So here's one of the place marks that I have and it shows that uh, this particular sighting date uh, happened in May, that there were three whales, it happened from a whale watch uh, tour and then when it's in Google Earth they can see that look what, wow if I was down there on the on the beach I could probably see those whales if they were jumping or you know spraying their water around so now now you're connecting that to something that that they can relate to maybe it's not just a, a photograph of a whale and you know surrounded by blue ocean they can see like well, if I went down there, I could look for whales. Um, but the so so that kind of picks up on the, the you know the use of technology for the lesson. It's a, a globalized topic as in, endangered animals and uh, problem solving. They're endangered, so how are we going to solve this? What can you do for for the whales? What what kind of solution is is possible? And and we mentioned this last time is is not to to design things that were you know just um, simple lessons where they're reading. You want the student to be interacting with it and you want them thinking. Uh, for me, I, I really like, I stress like active learning. And so I don't point out to them like, well, what's the solution to this? How do you save the whales? It's an open-ended problem. How, how do you suggest? What do you think? If you're going to solve a problem in the real world, what do you need? You need information, you need data. And so the, the lesson has a bunch of data and information for them. And then it's up to them to decide, uh, you know, a plan of action to take. And so I thought that was a good one that 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 kind of brought in all of those themes that we were talking about. Um, so, Jerome, do you have any questions or comments from the chat stream there to share with us? Well, we have uh, Jackie Cyrus, who you might know because she's from. Oh Maine. yes, you must half know day, Dr. Who lives there. Yeah, half a day, <laughs> Dr. Cyrus. Thank you. That's one of my mentors. Oh, wonderful. Well, she's yeah. done good work, I can tell. Oh, great. So, and then Nicole has just mentioned that uh, she used uh, Google Earth and then exports it to Maps to, to share some of their picture book locations. And I'm going to recruit her as, to convert that into a Google Earth. Yeah, that's, that's one of the areas I wanted to get into is, so we have the content on our websites. How is it that, that you share things with what do you have in mind? You want, when I have things on my website that it's the KMZ is the file for Google Earth and it's available for a free download. Okay, but then what? So uh, originally the teachers would download it and then share the file with their students. If you have a Google Earth file, you can share it. You can attach it as an email. Uh, my website now is, and your website also is open for uh, students or teachers to go to. So you could direct the student to the website and get the download from there. But uh, if you're going to have any kind of design content for Google Earth, it's it's something that needs to be, it's a special file that's downloaded. Uh, so first they have to get the file and then they put it in their Google Earth. What do you envision happens after that though, Jerome? Do you, do you, do you see this happening in a classroom or do you see it more on a personal basis that they're doing it at home or something like that? Well, you know, it, 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 that's that's an interesting question. I've been I've been tossing that around because I'm still in the middle of a nonprofit incorporation, and they want to know what you're doing and how it's done. And uh, one of the issues I have is I want it to go wherever it goes, 
to be used by whoever wants to use it. I don't care if we're talking private schools or public schools or alternative schools or, or libraries or uh, parents helping their kids or uh, kids who, uh, teachers who actually incorporate it in a more formalized sense into how they run their, their unit on a particular title. But I don't particularly want to uh, prescribe how they're used. As you know, Google Earth is so open that you can open up one of my files and you can tweak it. You can go. Uh, you can go and say, "Well, listen. You know, we were just looking at the size of this parking lot at this at this uh, uh, sporting venue. That's one of your lessons right. that I really, really like. And and you, you ran us through this wonderful math problem." you know, uh, challenge, I guess, where we're taking the, the area of the parking lot and minusing the area of the venue itself, and then we're counting how many parking s spaces there are, and we're wondering what it costs to park there and how much money you can generate in the parking lot and how much money you generate in the squ per square foot in the, the venue itself. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it seems to me that like, teachers can use it any way they want. Kids can use it. And teachers may assign it and all kids are using it, or they may not assign it, but say, hey, listen, it's out there. As you do the reading, you might want to travel through tonight's reading assignment on the Google Earth, or the Google Lit Trip version of it, and you'll be led to begin contemplating the kinds of deeper questions that will probably be our, our um, the, the, the uh, source of our conversation tomorrow. Or in reverse, you know, we'll have the conversation and we'll use the Google Lit Trip as a review, as a stimulant for, for uh, bringing all of that back to the 21st century. You're not going to live in 1930s uh, America. You, that will not happen. You know. So what do you care about depression? What do you care about immigration issues? Oh, well, because they're happening again. And so I don't think Grapes of Wrath is worth reading if we can't say... There's something there that fits the world that I'm preparing myself for, and and um, I want to listen to this guy, but I don't want to tell you know some teachers are really pretty damn excellent lecturers, believe it or not. I know that's not a popular thing to say, but I, I think that that these files can be used in any style and in any way that a teacher might want to add this dimension to um, how the kids are accessing and thinking about the lessons that are there in that book. You know, you know in the math classroom, what I would do, uh, you know, a lot of time, and, and, and math teachers can be stubborn of how they think things should be taught, and, and they're always driven on, like, covering topics, topic, topic. But I would, like, purposely, like, take a break and push them into Google Earth, and then uh, you would talk about last time, like, how kind of, like, motivation of some of the students would normally not be high for math, but then when they start doing things in Google Earth, they would just, you know, be crazy about it but um, oh. so I would do things I would do things some some activities I'd have in the classroom as like a, a, a quarterly project uh, the other things I would have kind of running over and I, and I would do it on Friday you know uh, at the school that I was at uh, you know we would give homework on on Fridays but it wasn't a popular thing but if I gave Google Earth homework on a Friday to do over the weekend you know, it wasn't it wouldn't, wouldn't normally be that involved they, they had no problem. I had zero complaints as far as any kind of like homework in Google Earth or, or using the SketchUp modeling uh, program, things like that. So when I, when, um, to, to, to do the lessons and things, you know, one way you could do it, would you could present it in the classroom. If you've got a lot of um, computers in your classroom, you could have everyone following along at the same time, but you can also do it at a, at a delayed instruction. You know, maybe my uh, a presentation could we could say uh, this is like um, flip your classroom with Google Earth, right? As I should have titled that for my ISTE uh, proposal this year. So I'm like flip your classroom with Google Earth, and then it would have been you know a really popular presentation. <laughs> but but you know same kind of thing. You're you're delivering uh, some content for them to do at home, and and then but it's not just content for them to view like a video, but it's interactive content. And uh, let me add to that, Thomas, because, you know, it used to be, and it still is, I, I, I realize, it is still an issue. Uh, do kids have Internet access at home? Do they have the technology? It surprises me how much of that technology really is out in 
for homes today. And what what we found, you know, I, I worked in a, in a district where there was some lower middle class and maybe even some borderline uh, poor people. There wasn't real impoverished uh, people. But I, I, I was concerned about that equity issue. You know, if you're rich, you can do that kind of homework or not. And we did some extensive surveys, and what we discovered is parents – whether they have a lot of money or don't have a lot of money, it's awful high priority for most parents to find a way to have their kids have uh, internet access, to have that technology where they can learn, where they can, where they can do. It. I was really surprised. We had, uh, we didn't have. I don't think we had four percent of the entire student body at my high school who didn't have something at home. Now, it wasn't always the fastest machine or not, mm -hmm. but they also had it at school and they had it at the city library and they had access to it um, throughout the community. And you and I, um, you know, we do share the same dedication to making that an easier problem because we give it away. And because Google gives it away, uh, at least that side of the expense is not an issue as far as... Uh, using our resources. And you mentioned before, like making it edit, editable. Uh, yeah, all the contents that I, the, the things that I put in, the, not just the Google Earth material, but also uh, for the most part, the, like Microsoft Word documents or, or things in docs and things. I do it so that the student, the teachers can edit the content if they want to and invite them mm -hmm. to, to design it. If it's a, like a farming lesson, I, you know, I'll give some examples for a certain region, but you know, if they live in uh, Pennsylvania, then I'll tell the, you know, I'll, I'll suggest like, well, do something that's relevant in Pennsylvania, wherever you are. You know, here's kind of a format for you to follow. Just you know, add some some questions on there that that relate to your region. But um, do yeah, the big th the big thing is that with the tablets and the iPads and the uh, bring your own device, and it's it's nice to see how Google Earth is um, keeping up with it for the most part. But I think you'd agree that that on our end, it's it's harder for us to design things. The things that we design are, are designed for, uh, you know, let's face it, like a computer uh, version of Google Earth. Uh, the iPad, it's possible to bring content in there, but it's not that easy, right? So if if mm -hmm. you've got one-to-one -one iPad deployment, how do you know? What do you think about that? As far as like our lessons on the iPad. Well, I have. Uh, I'm really excited about going mobile with Google Earth, so that. And in fact, I have a, a, a few model lit trips where you can walk down Cannery Row. I live 90 miles from Cannery Row, where you can walk down, and because the iPad has a GPS on it, there, it, there's a little blue dot, and actually, I can watch the blue dot as it approaches. Oh, there it is. <laughs> uh, you can watch the blue dot, and you'll see. Oh, here's a location, and now I pop up. Uh, websites and uh, video even that enhances the reality, the real world that I'm right in the middle of. Now, what Thomas says is really, really true. To tell you the truth, Google Earth itself is not all that easy to get up to speed on, although you can, if you want to build things, although you can make perfectly wonderful Google Earth-based projects by just learning about three pieces of code. Uh, four, four chess moves you said last time, right? Something like that, yeah. yeah. But um, going mobile, it's still kind of pioneering days because, uh, like like uh, Tom said, the windows don't fit. So I have to redesign. So I, I've designed some HTML sort of templates that restrict the, the content of the pop-up window to the 300 pixel wide windows that currently is all you can do because you have to take, and, and I want to get this back to a comment that Nicole made earlier. Uh, she talked about working both in uh, Earth and Maps and going back and forth, and it's a little yeah. bit clunky, yeah. but to go mobile, you have to get something to Google Maps. And once right. it's in Google Maps, then it has the restrictions of Google Maps in terms of window size. Although Google Maps has you know, it has traditional word processing kinds of skills. You don't really need to know how to do any programming. So you can go both directions. You can take advantage of Google Maps. Uh, 
that just has a bold button instead of having to learn the code for bold. Mm -hmm. Make sort of a version of it, and then you can send it to Google Earth and, and add whatever you'd like from Google Earth, or you can go the other way around. But you have to right now you have to get something into Maps, and then you can read it on your iPad. It's a little bit pioneering days, but it's kind of fun. But it's not something that you jump in and say, "Oh, I heard this good idea. I think I'll try it on Monday," and <laughs> without some practice. Um, this this gets into the features uh, the features that I would like to have. For, for Google Earth, you know, what's kind of a wish list, right? So, um, you, I mean, obviously, I think you and I are like developers for Google Earth. It'd be nice, it'd be nice if we could have things like the like the Earth Gallery, where where someone could just kind of load into our load our content from Google Earth rather than coming. I guess we want them with a website, but you know, I'd like to make it easier for the user to to get this design content from a third party person, right? To bring it into Google Earth. To bring it to Google Earth, not just for the the laptop version, but the mobile version, to you know, to bring one of your your uh, lit trips into an iPad, and and to use that in the iPad, uh, that's what I'd like. I'd like to to make that easier, and, and I think the viewing, you know, the left the left sidebar, the my places and things like that. If it's, I, I would like to be able to design content that would fit over there on the side. I think. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, you have your wish list. Do you have any wish lists of things that you'd like Google Earth to do that, you know, maybe it doesn't do right now? Well, uh, you know, I, I don't know why they don't have the WYSIWYG. The what you see is what you get. The bold buttons instead of they mm -hmm. did add. They've they've sort of eliminated having to know the code for inserting pictures and and for inserting links. Yeah. Uh, but they, even that is a little bit clunky. Uh, but it's not that tough. I mean, it, it is certainly doable. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that it's just a, a real – what I'm actually hoping is that the mobile version rises. Mm -hmm, sure, yeah. And what's happening um, – um, what I think is happening is that I can see that. I now know that on maps you can essentially do Earth in maps. And um, I, I just – I, I just think that, that Google Earth doesn't have tools. You can't uh, doesn't have tools in the mobile version. You can't build anything on an iPad. It still mm -hmm. has to be built on a computer because the and I, I shouldn't say iPad the mobile versions, whatever the mobile version is. And by the way, I don't like using the tablet. Uh, <laughs> Same for Android. Phones. Right, and I don't like uh, using it on phones mm -hmm. because the screen is just too small for what I really want to do on this. Uh, right, but. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> I was in the middle of making well, something. There. Oh, you know oh, the 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 one feature that has come out uh, in the last few years that you know if, if if someone hasn't been in Google Earth for a while, that's just perfect for us. Is that you, in Google Earth you can add hyperlinks, and not only that, it used to be like if you if you clicked on a hyperlink, it would open up a browser window, but now it's got a browser window that's right there in Google Earth. So yeah. this is a this is a screen grab of where uh, you can you could be in Google Earth and you could provide a link and then it, it swipes over and you've got a like I said a, a browser window in the I think it's Chrome in the main window and you can switch back and forth between the browser view and Google Earth and I well when I saw that I was I was very happy because that meant then you know I, for for design and I normally don't lead people away from the things that I that I make I want them to stay in it so so I like that part as a as a developer and right. the other thing is that um, uh, it just you know it's just <laughs> now you've got Google Earth and we've, we're we're singing the praises of it and now you've added the internet to it so what are the, there's no limitations right you can just branch out to to all so many different things now and um, Really provide a, a, a rich environment uh, for for learning. Right. It used to be just a couple of years ago you could put links into a Google Earth project, but it would take you out to your browser. And then I had difficulty in how do I tell the end user, well, you got to come back to the other program now. And it's wonderful that you can bring it in. Uh, that that they've combined a built-in browser so that. You're just right there. You just go right back to the back button, and, and you're on the spot. There's a couple of uh, comments I want to make here that are coming up here. They're sort of coming in fast and furious. I'd like to clarify my position regarding Maps versus Google is it's not a versus. 
both mm-hmm. have oh, yeah. distinct advantages over the other. And what's really nice is, unlike in some places where politicians can't play nicely together, maps and, and Earth do play nicely together. It's still a little like two steps if you want to use them both. Take the advantage of collaboration in maps, build that, take that project, move it over to Earth and do the, the tilting and the freezing of the, the views and things, save it as a KMA. Right. Uh, KMV, uh, and then you can send that out. Uh, in maps, you've got to have access to the map if you're going to use it in a classroom. In other words, you've got to have some kind of an account that kids can can log into. But over, you know, just jumping over those little hurdles makes them both much more powerful tools. And I, and I do want to go back to a comment that uh, Colin made earlier about science um, doing some distance education. And this is really exciting to me. I can just see his students are building things in different environments. And so he has a project, if I understand it right, where he'd like them to be doing something in their own environment and creating a KMZ there, and then it becomes part of a bigger class project. And, and, and that can be done. I mean, you can't collaborate as smoothly as in maps, but if, Tom, if you were making something in, in Guam and you wanted to be part of my project, you'd just send it to me and I'd drag oh. your place parts in and, and it's a done deal. But I'll tell you what might be of interest to you. Um, I, I was connected pretty closely to a woman who was the IT person at Punahou School in Honolulu, which happens to be Obama's um, uh, newly re-elected President Obama's uh, alma mater, and it's a very, very high-end private school. Yeah, I know that um, school. And I was um, invited over there to work uh, for three days with some students who were about to go off to uh, Costa Rica to do uh, biodiversity uh, surveys. And uh, the teacher there uh, was aware of my Google Literature project, and she said, what if we took that concept of putting science uh, uh, inf- data gathering on uh, Google Earth? And so I spent a couple of days showing the kids essentially here, we're going to do a little documentation, photography, and here's how we're going to get those into this. And, and we're going to do a little bit of questioning, and we're going to do a little bit of linking out to other resources once we collect our data. But we're going to keep our data in place marks. And so we went on a practice hike just outside of Honolulu. And every kid had a a digital, well, every group of kids had a digital camera and um, and a a handheld Garmin. Mm -hmm. And so we were walking down this trail and they would mark a spot on their handheld Garmin where they took a picture of some sort of a plant life that they were going to register. And or some sort of animal life as we walk down this trail. Meanwhile, the Garmin is keeping all the place marks for us. Yep. They're keeping the, the photo documentation or the audio documentation on their, their cameras or their phones or whatever. And when we got back, uh, we just practiced how do you assemble all this. Well, with a Garmin, you just plug it in to Google Earth, and it just says, yeah, I can bring all that in for you. Yep. And now what happens is we're walking down. We can walk that path again. So not only am I seeing the data, but I'm seeing it in virtual location. You can play it. You can play yeah. it, actually, right? Yeah. You can, yeah. yeah you can, in Google Earth, you can, like, hit play, and it'll show you, like, you walking down. And if you and stopped it, for lunch, it'll show you, like, pausing there, and it'll continue on, too. But if you stop for a, um, we stopped, as a matter of fact, for a uh, very unusual bird sighting, baby bird sighting, (laughs) a a chamois um, finch. And everybody got quiet because no one had seen a chamois finch. And we wanted to get the photo document, so someone did the place mark on the GPS. Now we're figuring, how do we get that photo to document that? And I'd done some documentary photo tips, but this little bird was just a little too far away. And one of the kids, I'll be darned if she said, hey, don't we have bird calls on our iPods that we're taking with us? Oh, really? She pulled out, uh, and she looked up thrush. It wasn't a chamois, I think a shawof uh, thrush, but she found a thrush, and she started playing that. And I'll be darned if that little bird didn't start coming towards us. And we got the documentation. And so wow. we could walk down that path in Google Earth a million times 
And when we get to that point where that happened or where that bamboo, that little bamboo sort of grove was, there it is. We've got an image of it taken right on that spot. It's just fantastic. And these kids were jumping up and down with excitement. Wow. At the shift of a way to keep the data. Yeah, that's a similar things kind of they're doing with, uh, like on my side, um, what they could, or they could be doing you know, with the, the um, sea turtles and things like that. And I've, I've done a similar thing with students uh, uh, on that science field trip kind of thing um, and, uh -huh. and incorporating the pictures and things in, into Google Earth. Um, and as you mentioned, it's not it's not uh, hard to to add. You know, definitely, the, the kids. There's plenty of tutorials online. If you know, if you I'm sorry, if you, if you came here like you know expecting a presentation like how to add place marks and things like that, there's plenty of content in Google Earth and online that you can find. And I, I think uh, well, it's on my website. There's some tutorials on how to do that, uh, how to add place marks, and you know as we said, the Earth. You can edit the Earth. You can add content to it. And if you want to do something. Uh, if you want to do something more, uh, like on my website, I've got some tutorials on how to add, you know, place marks with color, or you want to format it a certain way, like you saw the the whale watch uh, place mark from before. It, you know, if you want to get into that level of of adding content and you know really um, uh, presenting it in a certain way, it, that's nice about Google Earth and that you can if you, if, if you know some of the like HTML code, um, then you can do that. And it's 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 relatively easy. Uh, I've got several pages on my website that will show you like how to do this kind of like place mark code and add that in and add in hyperlinks and, and things and just making it, it's not, again, it's not just not Google Earth. You can make it a multimedia experience where they're linking to the internet. You can incorporate other things like digital photography or spreadsheets or Google Docs or, you know, this is so, so, it's so broad. And, um, and maps is an area that I, I haven't gone I haven't gone into so much, um, but you know for the mobile device, the geocaching is a is a kind of a popular thing now. Um, uh, those kind of things is uh, excellent for, but for our for our tours and things that the content that you and I make in our websites, the that seems to be that the the Google Earth uh, laptop or you know computer versions are what. What we need, and hopefully, hopefully, it shifts more to the to the mobile. And it is, it's changing. It is changing in, in the right direction. And you know, I don't want to put too much. You know, uh, this slide you have of your HTML code in, in color, mm -hmm. where you have the uh, uh, red text. And Nicole has pointed out that uh, there are HTML editors online, and I don't want people to be too frightened of it because literally. There's very little you'd have to learn, and it's just like, you know, you don't have to be a world class chair. Uh, and yeah, I can do much. it <laughs> if I can do it. <laughs> but, it so here's an example of code that I that I share in my, on, and it looks like you know anyone looks at it looks like it's just like gibberish and stuff. But you can find this code on my website, and you just kind of copy and paste it into Google Earth, and and then you can the, the red things that are there you change. And it says add color. And so if you want the background to be blue, then type blue. If you want the text to be in white, then type white. Uh, it add image or I'll add the text. And, and so I kind of give you the, the, the HTML kind of stuff that you may not know I've done for you. And then in the red is where you, you'd fill that in and um, <clears throat> design it to look like, like uh, something like this, if you wanted to get that level. Otherwise, you can just go and use the normal uh, Google Earth editor for, for things too. Adding hyperlinks and adding photos too. You can you don't have to know HTML to do that. I did something like that, uh, Thomas, with a um, an international cookbook that, that I had some kids working on the year before I retired. And uh, Oh, I like that uh, idea. Yeah, what the kids did was each kid had been assigned a country and they had to they had to sort of do some research on the culinary traditions and the holidays and some recipes, and it was in a cooking class essentially. And so, um, what I did was, I at that time I just created a word document, and I did the same thing you did, and I did one other thing. I, I made the the uh, the uh, HTML text pretty small font and mm -hmm. sort of a light gray, and the stuff that they had to replace, I made it red. Right, and the problem is in, in Google Earth, 
you can't do it there because they don't have colors in the Google Earth window. So it's kind of nice to just sort of you open up a Word document and you just say, oh, I have to put China there and someone else has to put Singapore in the same place. Copy mm -hmm. it, paste it, and it's and it's uh, good to go. Maybe someone can figure out how to do that in Google Docs so that we can add a collaborative easy piece uh, built off of that. Well, I've seen, uh, uh, you know, one thing that you can try is to do it in like Blogger. So you you kind of you set it up how you want it to look in Blogger, and then you know you can switch from or, or some you know other kind of like online editors, and you can switch to an HTML view. So mm -hmm. then you, you go from Compose and you set it up and you use the colors and things you want to do. Then you switch over to the HTML view, copy, and then you paste it into Google Earth. And sometimes you got to tweak it, but for the most part that works. So you can you can do something just normal, switch to the HTML and paste it into Google Earth. And another but, thing um, you can do is just cheat. I mean, if you see a window that you like on one of Tom's, and hey, how did he get that background blue? Yeah. Just open up his place mark and find the code. Copy and paste it. it. Yeah, yeah, just copy and paste. I do it all the time. Yeah. Sure. Well, Jerome, I think we're, I don't know if it's a 40, I think we have like a 45 minute limit, and so we're up against that again. Gosh, we always, uh, there's always so much for us to do. We're going to have to do this like a, can you, uh, a weekly show can or you something. A, I, can, I wanted to you ask you, um, yeah. I'm sorry. I wanted to ask you for the for people starting out, for like a beginner teacher who's watching, you know, a teacher that hasn't done things in Google Earth. Uh, how about like a one tip? Do you have a tip for them? Like how what should they do to start to start uh, doing something for Google Earth? Well, let me let me see if I can bend your question a little bit. If you'll go to the fourth slide from the end, the fourth, okay. fifth, and uh, the f the fourth, third, and second slide from the end. Um, these are built into Google Earth, and they're just really good things to know if you haven't explored them, um, because there's an awful lot built in. In Google Earth, there's something. Uh, I don't, there's no way to point to this, but if you see that little red box uh, on the left-hand side, Google Gallery, if you click that, Google has already collected all kinds of pre-done. Uh, projects that other people have done and they even have a little that category thing in blue that you might be able to see one of them is education and culture and history and business and and there's so many things that people have done you can do any kind of a Google search and add KMZ or KML to it polar bears KMZ and and you'll find someone's done a Google Earth thing on polar bears if you go to the next slide real fast I can do this in just a second there's pages and pages on this slide. This is Google Earth for Educators. It's a website that Google has made specifically for us. And towards the top, there's a kind of a row of blue um, uh, little rectangles. And the second one over is a whole bunch of tutorials. But they talk to you as an educator. And then the very next slide is one that is, this is Google Earth Outreach. I don't know if how many of you know this, but Google.org is um, a whole different website that, that's uh, Google's philanthropic arm. And they have a specific philanthropic support for people doing uh, nonprofit sort of work in uh, Google Earth. But their tutorials are wonderful. They don't hide them from you. You're certainly welcome to use it. Mm -hmm. they have their free stuff until you're um, uh, an official nonprofit. But that's another really wonderful site for resources for getting started. See now, what I would like would be to have your like our content in the gallery, because when you when, and when you use this stuff, when you use the gallery, if you select these things, you don't have to worry about downloading a file. It just loads up into your Google Earth. It's just one click, and and so it kind of right. uh, eliminate, eliminates kind of a middleman kind of process. So I I I think that's kind of what I would like to, be, you know, and I think that would work. That would help uh, with the with the mobile. Uh, problem that we were talking about, but um, you know, I would like to say if you're starting out with, uh, you you want to design something for Google Earth, you want to like get into this area, start with something that you that you know, something something that you love, you know, favorite lesson of yours, something that you, you know, uh, are really familiar with, and then try to incorporate it into Google Earth, and it's going to happen automatically. It'll be natural that you're gonna you're gonna like you're gonna find ways to tweak that favorite lesson of yours for Google Earth. And, and for me, one of the first, I think the first thing that I did 
<clears throat> it's fairly common in Guam is um, is we get typhoons here. And so what I what I did was um, had storm data from a typhoon that came, a super typhoon uh, that came and f took the data and had the students map it in Google Earth. And that was like one of the first things that I that I that I did. And what I found was like, well, you know, it's not just like a static view. It's something that they could play. It's a it's a historical map that uh, they could, they could go through it and they could add content to it. They could add photos if they had some sort. Of, you know, because we we'd get like slammed by these typhoons, uh, especially if they had photos they want to add to the, the this um, you know Google Earth thing. And the students made these. You know, the students made like their own version of this uh, typhoon map. But so it was it's fairly common for us to do typhoon tracking maps, but to do one in Google Earth was something different and it just added I could go on and on, like all the different kind of aspects that it added to it. So um, take something that, that you're familiar with, something that, that you uh, favorite lesson of yours that you love and and try putting it in Google Earth and you're you're gonna see some other possibilities of adding hyperlinks to those, you know, kind of resources. Things that just gonna happen uh, easily, and and uh, you know perhaps we'll we'll improve it some. Um, I'll also uh, say, Thomas. Uh, I think we have ten minutes left. Is that correct, more or less? Well, I, you know, I at one point I read that we had forty five oh, minutes. Oh, forty five. Okay. Because of the the main reason is this being recorded for YouTube. Right. And uh, and that they want to keep those files uh, file okay. size down. But you know, I yeah. could be. No I just put uh, a comment, and you may have to refresh to see it. That mm -hmm. just said, "Any questions not answered now? We can try sure. to get you in." And Thomas keeps a full-time job. I'm retired. This is my full-time job, and it and it does give meaning to my retirement. So, if I, uh, you know, I'll keep this transcript, and if I see any questions that uh, weren't addressed, I'll see if I can get back to you. On that. Um, and and and, um, and would you say your website's had a, a impact on your life? Jerome? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Right? Um, yes. <laughs> in, I, in, I, in, in wonderful ways. I, you know, I, I have to say, like I spoke of last time, how during the summer I had I was kind of pushed up against the wall of whether to continue real world math or not because they're getting rid of the mobile me, uh, you know, the server that I was, you know, the host that I was using before. And so the question was, well, do I continue with this? Do I, you know, rebuild and move on and on? And so, you know, that's what I did. And um, uh, I can speak for Jerome, I think, in that uh, it's it's a lot of it's not always easy for us to to um, present these things. I'm not getting any money for it. I don't think Jerome's getting any any money for this. It kind of speaks to what Dan, uh, Daniel Pink wrote, writes about in Drive. And that when you're you're doing something to, to the autonomy to do something just for feeling that you're doing something for someone else is a huge motivator to feel that you're providing something important and that's that in itself is a is a reward and so any kind of feedback we ever get from people questions comments or any kind of collaboration uh, is always greatly appreciated uh, I know for me yeah, and and I'm really serious about uh, that's what I want to do with my retirement, and uh, is be there for those of you who are out there in the in the front lines doing the noblest work on earth. So don't send me an emergency because I might be traveling, but send me yeah. emails if I don't know the answer. I probably know someone I can ask. We'll get back to you. Okay. You want to put up that last slide so people make sure they have tweet. Contact for us. Just All right, let me. There it is. Okay. And this will be up on YouTube tomorrow, I think. Won't it? It'll it'll be up probably in an in an hour. We'll have it up here, okay. and you can view it in uh, if you find this post. In, oops, sorry. If you find the post in uh, in uh, Google Plus, you'll be able to click on it, and it'll play the video form right there, or you can or it links into YouTube also. And the title for this one will be Google Earth and Education Part Two, in YouTube. And then, again, if you wanted to watch Part One. If you wanted to see what happened, the exciting things that happened in part one, uh, you can search for that too on YouTube, Google Earth and Education part part one. Follow us on Twitter, send us uh, and, and follow us on Google Plus as well. And uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. And thank you, Jerome. I was very, very happy when you agreed to, to do this with me. And something tells me that we're going to be doing this again. Maybe we'll take this, uh, we'll take this on the road or something. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> In there. Okay. okay. All right. Care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.
and enjoy your weekend. All right. All right.